the plan for this session, right, is Eunice, we've prepared some questions, obviously, but it will be better if you have specific questions you want answered. Um, you go ahead and just ask away. We're very interested in exactly what it is you're interested in talking about. Eunice, let me turn it over to you and, uh, and let's start talking about e-commerce. Well, let me just start off with just a, a brief introduction. Kurt Anderson, he is the author of Stop Being the Best Kept Secret, being released today on Amazon. And he is the founder of B2Btail.com, an e-commerce resource guide for manufacturers. And if you haven't been on that site yet, it is amazing in terms of what you can find find there. Um, Kurt founded an e-commerce company in 95 that was ranked third on the Internet Retailer Magazine top 1,000 e-commerce companies and after selling it, which he did so well on that, um, he's been uh, an e-commerce consultant targeting manufacturers working in the, from the New York area. Uh, Michael is recognized as a key executive within the maintenance, repair, and operations MRO uh, industry. Uh, his experience is unmatched in understanding distribution and supply. And Really, he's so well known for negotiating the big, single largest MRO su supply deal in the 2000s of over 300 million. So we're really excited to have you both here joining us with Rob, of course. You know, his expertise is in digital transformation of companies, supply chain and marketing. And he's been creating diagrams, uh, paradigms for B2B clients and sustainable growth for the B2C in areas. So. Gentlemen, let me start off with this question, and I will go with um, starting with Kurt. Okay, and what is the opportunity for industrial B two B companies in e commerce today? Wow, it's uh, it's massive. But uh, for, first off, thank you guys. Thank you, Rob, Eunice, the whole team at Core Shop. Thank you, Michael. This is awesome. Greg was great. Brian, Trish, this is. Just such a well-needed event. So, Rob, kudos to you and your team for pulling us off. Great job. And um, so, uh, one thing you know to think about is uh, there's a stat. I, it was on digital e-commerce uh, 360. Uh, U.S. manufactured goods last year were six trillion dollars. Six trillion dollars. Of that six trillion, 356 billion, still a huge number, was uh, distributed via e-commerce. That represents 5.9% of all U.S. manufactured goods were distributed via e-commerce. So there's a 94% upside opportunity of $6 trillion. So there, the, the opportunity is just massive. You know, uh, B2C has been heavy, you know, for years. And I think now, especially with COVID, but even prior to COVID, manufacturers, industrial suppliers have really needed to get into this, uh, this arena, if you will. So. Great. Um, what do you think is uh, important in building out the e-commerce area, Rob? Uh, that's a great question. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, what I, what I want to talk about, and I hope we're going to talk about in detail around building out e-commerce, is uh, my my particular expertise is around platforming. So what is platforming? And that is we've heard a lot about a PIM. Um, but uh, I, I take a full supply chain view. So how do you get data from the ERP all the way out to where you need to distribute that information? Platforms can include uh, everything from Shopify to Magento. Uh, it can include uh, big commerce. There are many e-commerce players, but what makes business to business different is the number, detail, and variation of products, kitting, and information that has to be managed. The other thing that B2B does that uh, retail doesn't is the way we pay, right? There are terms, there are purchase orders, there are some have uh, pay cards. Uh, there are many, many different prices, even among your customers for quantity discounts and other things. Being able to manage all of that is actually a reasonably complex effort. And that's why um, one of the things that, uh, since I'm based here in Houston, as we've begun to take a look at uh, the collapse of the oil industry, a number of manufacturers are looking at, how do I pivot, right? How do I move from supplying one industry into another industry? And perhaps the most famous opportunity of all 
is how many chemical companies are now supplying hand sanitizer? Mm -hmm. I've helped two. So, so, so how do you how do you do those pivots beyond just product, and how do you get it out in front of a truly industrial audience, right? And I and I think that's an important piece for us to explore today. But I think it's also important that uh, that Michael actually get in on that first question. Mike, yes. uh, would you uh, would you add your two cents? My two cents, sure. Um, I, I have to say, uh, Kurt, uh, I enjoyed your introduction, but uh, 1994 is the first time I was on this type of uh, call talking about storefronts for B2B. And, and that's kind of the experience of a lot of the major distribution firms I've worked with and been with is there are iterations of this that go back over 26 years of how are we going to use this channel? Are buyers going to commit to it? Do we need to follow the buyer's lead? And I, I am convinced that we are there at least for some of the types of spend that we understand as B2B. Auto replenishment and uh, uh, identified spare parts, critical spares, sourced specific OEMs and suppliers. That doesn't go online. It won't. It'll continue to be an automated relationship. But spot buys, I don't need it, but I don't know I need it, but I need it tomorrow type stuff, absolutely will be uh, e-commerce procurement. So from the distributor's perspective, it's okay. We may have tried this a few times. Uh, some of the firms I've been with, I'll just mention them, MSC and Fisher Scientific, are highly, thoroughly confident at e-commerce uh, sales and support. And it is a different animal, a different channel than a lot of industrial distribution. But to your earlier point, well, 90% of industries in the business to business world. Someone mentioned Granger earlier. They're the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many, many firms that do that. And of those firms, uh, a very high percentage is conveyed outside of e commerce, but there is an opportunity. The opportunity for distributors, though, is to really focus on developing their own internal content, not relying on other providers, not relying on other manufacturers. And those firms that have clocked e-commerce in the past own their own content and develop their own content, both things. Mm -hmm. uh, so content development is one. The other opportunity, as I see it, is developing pricing control. Rob, that's something you touched on when you mentioned platforms. It mm -hmm. is fundamental. I will lose money if I have to just shoot a price or live with some published price rather than be able to have different uh, manufacturer-supported pricing from my clients I get a discount from this cutting tools manufacturer when I sell to this automotive. Uh, that pricing management has got to be in, in the tools or I'm better okay. off using my own tools, right? Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, should I make all of my content available on a market site of some type, Amazon or a neutral uh, third party market site? Uh, that's a, a later question. But the first question is, do I have the pricing controls if I do that? And mostly the answer is no. I heard earlier that Amazon is trying to address that, but that's the big give that distributors are worried about is having to give up pricing management in a, in a number of different ways. I wanna jump on that um, because I've got a particular experience. You know, it's not just the pricing management, it's also the way that B2B buyers purchase. Um, okay. So we, we had a client in terms of their customers order for 100 different locations and they order in bulk, but they also want to be able to see, okay, well, what's my total order of this entire type of product, but I'm going to put it over 50 stores, but I also want to see, you know, per store, that kind of breakdown you will not get in a B2C situation. So we actually had to develop as part of their platform, the ability to handle buying the way your customer buys so that it actually becomes a better experience uh, for, for that and, and a more useful experience than just, you know, as you said, your own tools. Well, their buyers were using essentially Excel spreadsheets and sorting and looking at and making sure they maximize their discounts. But, you know, looking at what's the freight cost going to be and all of that goes into a B2B buy. It is significantly complex. Um, but putting that in an easier to use uh, interface online uh, dramatically saves the customer time as well as improves actually the, the flow through of the dollars 
for our client. Um, but these are the issues that you really have to think through up front in B2B. Sorry, Eunice, I didn't let you ask another question. We should let No, that's talk. good. <laughs> well, that leads me kind of to, you know, what is the experience of um, multi-channel, omni-channel selling? You know, where are we changing with that, considering all the controls that need to be in place if we're truly becoming an omni-channel company? No, that's a good question. So, um, you know, a couple of different points. So, uh, you know, say if you have a, a OEM, somebody, you know, company has a finished good, uh, preparatory product versus, uh, you know, uh, a vast majority of manufacturers in the United States are, are 20 people, employees and less. And they're small, they're job shops or they're machine shops or, you know, they're making a product or a component that goes into a good. And a couple of things um, that kind of that's going on in my world or that we're really working hard on is creating, I call it, how do you scale that preparatory process? So some of these smaller custom manufacturers uh, that don't have a preparatory product, you know, unfortunately they kind of have that, that job shop uh, mm -hmm. blues or the job shop curse, if you will, where 50, 60% of their sales is with, uh, you know, one customer. And the nice diverse, uh, to diversify for them with e-commerce, there's a great opportunity to uh, take, that, take that process that they've done for you know possibly decades or maybe generations or what have you and you know so the book i just wrote is called stop being the best kept secret they have everything in their corner uh, machinery equipment raw materials skill set staff everything to just really attack the market the problem is they're the best kept secret so with e-commerce whether um, they can take that widget that product that part uh, put it on a marketplace we've talked a lot today about amazon uh, Alibaba's new to the market. There's MFG, ThomasNet. So, I mean, there's a lot of options for people to utilize. The other thing that's uh, very, very bullish on that I've, I'm seeing a lot of success, companies are starting to create uh, configurators or using a software tool where they can allow a customer to customize and build out their own product. And uh, I've been seeing some great success stories with that where before, um, you know, it's that buying process and I've got to submit a drawing, I need to submit a uh, RFQ, I'm going to wait hours, days, weeks for the uh, quote to be turned around. We're now with this configurator or like a quote building type uh, software tool. Uh, now a customer can come on and what I always like to preach is like, how can we help our customer make a buying decision at midnight without having to wait for us to open up our doors on Monday? And by, you know, attacking keywords and, you know, we could talk later about a content strategy. I think Mike mentioned that. And, um, you know, and, he, and I know with his experience at MSC, like MSC is just crushing it. They're a stalwart and really a benchmark on how to attack an e-commerce uh, strategy. But with this configurator uh, process, um, a company I'm working with right now, Faulkner Electronics, great uh, custom manufacturer since 1985. We created a software tool where Fortune 500 companies, Boeing, Virgin Hyperloop, they can come on the, this tool 24 seven. They build their own product, they're done. They, uh, we, have, we even have a button where the customer can hit buy, pull out their credit card. Now, again, these aren't, uh, like Greg was talking earlier about million dollar machines or big ass fans, these are smaller purchases, but the customer can actually take out their credit card, make a purchase, and they're done. The buyer can go on and, and uh, move on to the 30 other things they have going on that day and complete that sale. The, the, the vendor, this, in this example, Falcon Electronics, they're paid before the product not only is shipped, but they're paid before they even manufacture the product. So it's pure just in time. So it's really exciting. I'm starting to see more of that going on. And it's really exciting for small manufacturers to get in this game, so. Mm -hmm. Michael, what do you, as a client, as being the on the client side, what do you think is the advantage of all that? We were talking about uh, multi-channel and omni-channel and in various types of industrial distribution. And there are a lot of different sectors within distribution in the United States and Canada. So just think of all of those business to business relationships, whether they're office supplies or 5,000 fittings, or, you know, any of them, any number of different core competencies. If you think about those types of business to business distributors, they're all, they've always been on the channel. They've always responded to what buyers ask them to do. The buyer says, get on our vertical marketplace. We say, yes, sir. And we get on the vertical marketplace for that one customer. The buyer says, integrate with my instance of SAP and make your content available to SAP buyer. Yes, sir. We will we'll integrate with 
SAP. Uh, in a business to business world, distributors are looking for efficiency and automation. A lot of times, many, many times, they're better at finding those efficiencies than the clients they're working with. The client maybe doesn't have the time to actually do a full integration in SAP. But a lot of this is buyer directed. And so when buyers started saying, get on Amazon business, yes, sir, we'll get on Amazon business. But what's changed is Amazon business works to some degree because it isn't just uh, fulfillment by Amazon and taking title. It's also a vendor neutral marketplace that simply conveys orders. And that's what's always been missing in our space is a vendor neutral marketplace. So Amazon says they are neutral. Distributors are, are trying to decide if they believe them. But the bottom line is the decision about where these industrial distribution business to business transactions will be facilitated is still up for grabs. It could be that uh, a business model comes up that says, we only want to be a vendor neutral marketplace. We just want to be a matchmaker, a smart market of some type, self-clearing smart market. Or it could be that Amazon wins. Uh, I heard it earlier today with unlimited resources, it's kind of hard to beat them. But all these little industrial distributors are making those decisions right now. You know, they've gotten up close over 26 years and said, yeah, this sounds like something that could happen and, and create more revenue for my business. But again, it was always single customer focused, single customer directed. What's changed is Amazon, Amazon's success, even though they're just dabbling in business to business when you look at it as a percentage of their current revenues, it's moving our industry. People are people mm -hmm. are taking it seriously. Rob, would you like to add to that? Well, I'll cover the other side, right? So I, I think that uh, uh, Kurt and Mike great, make great points, right? Using, having the, the buyers drive where you're going and creating that, that channel to your buyers is absolutely critical. But one of the things that anyone who thinks about e-commerce is thinking about their own channel, right? And that is, how do I put up an e-commerce site and how do I make it happen? And we heard from Trish that she started, you know, one section at a time. And, and she's a, you know, that Citizen is a huge manufacturer. It's got a lot of data. But whether you're a huge manufacturer with 100,000 parts or you're small and you've only got, you know, 20,000 parts or 2,000 parts, the process begins the same. And, I, and, and during this time, I've changed my thinking a little bit, and I call it the 80-20 rule. Right, more than likely, 20% of your product uh, accounts for 80% of your business. Mm -hmm. So rather yeah. than going out and trying to put 100% of your parts out there and 100% of your product, if we break this down and begin to work a chunk at a time, we're able to accelerate your owned process as well. So instead of something, and you heard, right, th th these are major projects, and like any major IT project, it takes months and years. So in this area of pivot, how do you compress months and years down to months and weeks? And the way, in my opinion, you do that is, um, is you really think about three things. Ease of use of the software, of the platform, right? Nothing gets used or adopted without ease. The second one is what are you trying to put out there? That's the 80-20 rule. And the third one is to immediately take advantage of all of these types of channels. In other words, yeah, I would be on Amazon. I would be on Alibaba. I would be on an auction site. I would be connected through traditional EDI with my biggest customer. But as you're working through that, the opportunity is to consolidate all of that down into a single source of truth and ability to manage Amazon and everything else, your own websites, your own currencies, whatever size amount of your business is from one place. Because the number of options today are overwhelming. And therefore, mm -hmm. I think that's the opportunity for people today is to really get moving fast and then expand. You never eat an elephant, you know, the whole thing. It's just one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the most difficult part of getting started? Getting started? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I, I think that, you know, I, I think actually uh, uh, Mike would be would be a great answer. But but I'll tell you as from a vendor perspective, right? I can tell you that there are a few things, right? You need to build an ROI case. We heard that from Trish. You need mm -hmm. to be you need to be able to talk to your management about why. And that's probably why some of you are here today. So I'm encouraging your questions. Um, you know, what is the opportunity? Learn about what what Kurt just shared. And then the third thing is to uh, is to really begin to think outside the box. And that's where a lot of people don't in the United States, right? Most people have not heard of what a PIM is. To be honest, mm -hmm. they're very prevalent in Europe and and not here. But from the client side, let, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear what Mike has to say. In terms of where do you start and where's the greatest difficulty, we've talked around and around, it's the same thing. Uh, and I apologize for repeating myself, but it's always data first. Content is king, right, Rob? Where did we hear that before? Yeah. Like 20 years ago? Content yeah, is king. Yep. But pricing is emperor. And from a distributor's perspective, I'll say it again, I have to have tools that allow me to manage my pricing to the minute. Opportunistic pricing, uh, up and down, current, accurate. A lot of platforms miss that, and so I've got to have a PIM and be able to manage those pricing files as if they were my own, my own online tool. Because, like I said, there are some distributors that have been very successful with online catalog sales for decades. And those firms know how to manage price and their legacy AS400 systems. But uh, managing across other platforms, it's always, I, I don't want to give up everything. I'm not going to show my best price necessarily. And uh, so content, if you're just getting started, is critical. There are uh, mom and pop type industrial distribution consortiums that are five times larger than Granger and Spend, by the way. They're very large influential organizations with hundreds of constituent distributors. So they've been working in various ways on developing content, but we're on year five of having some meaningful content that they can all share. And, and where it falls apart is everybody's got a different price. Everybody has a different relationship with those manufacturers. The manufacturers cut a different special pricing agreement with the end user. And it becomes very difficult to manage that part of it you can put up the pictures and dimensional information, but without pricing management, you lose a lot of traction and a lot of distributors are gonna hold back for that reason. Mm -hmm. Do you think that with COVID, a lot of that, the, those relationships in terms of sales were, were done in person or there was a more personal you know, relationship in order for me to get a pricing from this person because I know them. How do you think that's changing now? Um, I know the platforms have to change in order to adapt to the new sales availability, but what else is changing in that respect? The paradigm is the reason that e-commerce hasn't taken off like wildflower, wildfire in all those business-to-business -business industrial distribution relationships is because they're human-to-human -human sales. They're not B2C, they're not B2B, they're H2H. -H. It doesn't just mean face-to-face, -face. it means I trust you because you've delivered in a tornado. Mm -hmm. I trust you because you've come out at midnight when you were at your daughter's birthday party to help us fix a problem, roll up your sleeves and, you know, dig out a bearing. Uh, industrial distributors provide services and that human to human interaction builds trust. So that most buyers sometimes, many times don't care what the price of goods are. They care that Bob will come out the next time because we pay them through the purchase of products from Bob's company. So, COVID changes that slightly a couple of ways. Uh, the main one is distributors are figuring out that remote working actually works, right? Mm -hmm. It's always been the CFO saying, hey, can you guys please travel less? Please take fewer flights. Mm -hmm. And and the reality is nobody wanted to give up that face-to-face -face time, but nobody likes being on planes and in hotels. And what all these firms have found over the last few months is it was a waste of money. You can You can use services like what we're using today, go to meeting, all those others, and effectively conduct business because the trust, maybe you've met once, maybe you've known them in the past, the trust comes from performance. Material shows up. I can look you in the eye and say, we had a, a disruption because of COVID, the truck's not running on time, but this material, this truckload will be there tomorrow. That's business to business, right? It's not 
all ones and zeros, it's human to human. Mm -hmm. And COVID, COVID has changed that. But you can't find solution. Uh, you mentioned MSC, I've been with MSC. When you're looking for production, cutting tools, improvements, you have to walk the floor. So mm -hmm. that never goes away. It just means people uh, have to protect themselves when they get into that, you know, let's go walk the floor and look for opportunities. Mm -hmm. Great. Kurt, what do you think is the, the, a bigger opportunity for these manufacturers that are, that are mom and pop to move into this new environment of e-commerce? Once again, you know, the market, I just think the market's massive. So, I mean, even, even if the market went up 300%, it's still only 20% of all of manufacturing. So, I mean, it's it just, the market's just massive. I, I, I'm going to dovetail and piggyback off of Mike. I, I absolutely love what you just said, Mike, and, and content is absolute king. And I guess if there's any takeaway from, you know, my words or what I'm going to share is consistency, consistency, consistency. So, um, you know, in my book, I talk about, uh, you know, you know, work with, with uh, manufacturers, it, there's great opportunities to dominate search. And when I say that, so, uh, you know, years ago in retail, like, in a, you know, I started an e-commerce business in 95. There was no Google. There was no social media. It was like, you know, it was Yahoo was uh, Overture, some of these old, you know, dial, dial up things that were going on in the 90s. But today there's just so many opportunities between social media. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of blogging, getting that content uh, for manufacturers, creating those resource guides, because I'm, I'm telling you consistently, there are great opportunities for these small manufacturers in these niches where their, uh, their keywords are still wide open. If you're trying to get into shoes or flowers or some real, uh, you know, challenging words, I was kid, uh, keywords, I was kid around with clients. I'm like, if you want to earn first page ranking on those keywords, you've got a better chance of seeing me with hair. It's just not going to happen. But a lot of these niche manufacturers have inexpensive strategies with Google ads, Google shopping, uh, social media. Um, I'm starting to see a lot of really fun, exi exciting uh, new strategies. There's a lot of podcasts that are, that are out now that are targeting manufacturers. There's mm -hmm. one called MFG Out Loud with Allison DeFord and Ray Zagato. They just crush it on their podcast. Chris Lukey, who uh, runs Manufacturing Happy Hour, he's a Rockwell mm -hmm. automation guy. He's built up a, a great uh, crowd. There's a group called Exit Your Way. They're succession planning guys up in Seattle. They have a, a group that meets every week and they're really targeting manufacturers. So they've really, a lot of, you're seeing a lot of these, uh, you know, and a lot of these people are digital immigrants. A lot of these folks are, are older and they're mm -hmm. instituting these digital strategies into an old school manufacturing. I was on a call with a inbound marketing firm up in Madison yesterday. Uh, Greg uh, Michio is his last name. He owns a uh, windbound and he's starting to institute uh, uh, webinars for and with his, his clients, just like, uh, you know, just like you guys, Rob and your team are doing today. So there's a lot of new opportunities, consistency, and as Michael said, content is king. So I think there's just enormous opportunities for, for small industrial companies. Great. We have a question from the group. Um, what are some of the tools out there to help me stand out from a manufacturing point of view, of course? Sure. Uh, Kurt, you want to start and then I'll follow up go ahead tools um i'm 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 kind of a linkedin junkie so i i think if you know you're in b2b industrial space um you know i'll go simple on 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 uh linkedin um social you know when i had my e-commerce business in the in the 2000s we were very aggressive with um as soon as a new platform came out our kind of mission or goal was we didn't want to be bit, beat by our competition by ignoring something new that came on. So as soon as Twitter was out, YouTube were doing how-to how videos, uh, started capturing thousands of views. So I guess tool-wise, I would say I, I'm a strong proponent of social media, where your tribe is at, you know, do your persona mm -hmm. exercise, find your avatar, and what platforms are they on. YouTube is, is very, uh, you know, very powerful tool. And of course, you know, Google, Google Analytics, Google Ads, Google Search Console. Everything that I just mentioned is completely free. I'm very cheap. So not everything I just mentioned is, is absolutely free. It just, you know, it's a time commitment and just getting in the game. Mm -hmm. Rob? Yeah, I would say that, you know, uh, Brian made a great point, and that is that really product is leading. And that doesn't matter whether your product is, uh, is a nut 
or it's a complex uh, turbine system, right? It's still about what is the product. And therefore, most sales today is a lot of education first before you mm -hmm. move to negotiation. Mm -hmm. In terms of education, I think that, that YouTube is the way to do it. Um, I think that it should be incorporated into your website. And, and then I'd add from a market platform, from, from a platforming perspective, if you're looking for, for how do you actually, again, manage all of this, look for systems that incorporate your ability to run your campaign out of one place, out of your, out of your, uh, out of your owned space. You need to be able to handle the keywords. You should be able to post and accept your YouTube videos. You should. Uh, and then email marketing is still very, very much alive. It's, it's more than alive. It drives most repurchase uh, of, uh, of information, uh, of products on a B2B website. So it, it is really block and tackling. I think the difference is that you need to look for tools uh, that allow you to manage that easily on your website, right? And so depending on the size that you are, right? Um, you know, Shopify has uh, has some some advertising tools. Um, they are they are kind of limited, in my opinion, uh, but they're integrated and integrated uh -huh. counts on the higher mm -hmm. end. Right. If you begin to look at what uh, Citizen does, right, uh -huh. it's able to manage and create um, campaigns and all of that marketing information. And what's fascinating to me, even their product development information all on a single platform in a publish anywhere kind of format. They can publish to Amazon, they can publish to their own websites, their distributors, um, you know, even out to uh, the information needed by their retailers. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do see how the similarities between going to market against uh, going from a retailer perspective of going to B to C, also, those same um, principles of marketing really go forward for the manufacturing as well in terms of making sure that your website is easy to use, make sure that you have the the uh, not just the content, but the consistency. Again, we go to with what Kurt said, right? The consistency of having it. What do you think is the future of B2B e-commerce and how's it changed you know what will we be looking at i mean is is brick and mortar going to be as important for manufacturers now or where are we going that's that's a great question i think all three of us should answer it but i'm mm -hmm. i'm going to jump in right here and that is look i don't think that things are going away but i do think the opportunity is efficiency okay um if you look at the a value chain that is what's being disrupted right so if you take a look at a manufacturer who distributes to a master distributor who distributes to you know a, a next tier distributor who moves it out to you know wherever the final product is that supply chain is going to uh that that value chain is going to collapse because there's tremendous opportunity uh, and and money in between that product manufacturer and the end client. And we've been doing this for years, but digital e-commerce gives you a tremendous opportunity to do that. And it's primarily around what we just talked about, which is being found. And the second one is around pricing control and content, which we've been talking about. The area that remains is that human to human contact. Right. I don't think you hammer out, uh, you know, a multi-million dollar deal on e-commerce. It's yeah. unlikely. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we have a customer who you actually have to be licensed in order to distribute their goods. Right. So you have to have a process to get signed up. However, the opportunity is the efficiency of once I have a deal and I've got, mm -hmm. you know, 50 clients. The efficiency of the reorder process, the fulfillment process, the direct the delivery process now allows me to move easily from just handling 50 clients to 500 from 50 contracts and prices to, you know, 400 uh, 
all of that becomes much, much faster, easier, and actually a better user experience, which then transforms your human to human. I'm stealing that, Mike. Your human to human interaction, um, mm -hmm. to focusing on the things that you know they're good at, right? Relationship, mm -hmm. service, and that kind of differentiation. Mike, would you like to answer that as well? Sure. I, I think what I was hearing was uh, the future of B2B e-commerce uh -huh. solutions. And I think about different technologies, Rob. Um, one of the items is a lot of what kicks off the, the demand signal or the order is, in my world, a maintenance management system, right? Inventory control, work orders against assets. It all ties together. Normally, it lives in a ERP like SAP. But the replenishment, the purchasing part of that is going to continue to become more automated. The system will have computer vision systems that see the inventory, know that a minimum has been reached because they saw somebody took the item and automatically order from a leveraged supplier that you've already done a deal with. From my perspective, that's also e-commerce. It's leveraging technology and the, the shift is even fewer buyer resources, fewer tactical buyers involved in the business to business space. Why would I bother a full-time equivalent to go get office supplies if I could just monitor optically uh, supply closets for office supplies and know, it's almost like internet of things. The system, the closet knows it has to reorder those items, it hit a minimum. It's not rocket science, it exists now. And along with that is image recognition. If I do have to source something that I've never bought before or it's a critical spare, this goes back to what Kurt was saying about job shops. If I can send uh, very quickly a three-dimensional image of what it is I need, I've over-communicated in many cases exactly what it was I needed to that job shop or to that random or unique supplier that actually provides that old spare part that I need to run my line. So image recognition could be for commercially available products. Just send a picture up and you can do this now on, on most search engines, but I'm saying in a more robust fashion identify the item and the search trend based on an image, not a part number. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are different ways to use that technology. So in some, it's the internet of things, the idea that I don't need a buyer, I can self-serve if I'm the maintenance guy or an engineer and need a component. I don't have to source. There's a tool called Google or Amazon or whatever the, the biggest winner is that will actually do that for me. At SAP, I think they call it guided buying the notion that you can describe a product and it will find for you outside of a tactical buyer relationship. Kurt? Yeah, well, it's tough to follow these two. That uh, These guys, they summed it up phenomenal. Just, uh, again, my, my world's a little bit smaller. The, the companies I deal with are on a smaller side. So kind of talking to that mom and pop shop or, you know, a company that has 50 employees and less, um, which, again, is a vast majority of manufacturers in the United States. Uh, you know, a lot of times there's the, the perception that, you know, oh, we're just a little machine shop or just this little greasy, you know, but what they don't realize if you're an engineer at Boeing and you need one little part, one little trinket, and boy, you've been making that little trinket for the past 50 years. And again, you're just the best kept secret. There's just so many opportunities because that the engineer at Boeing wants to find them just as desperately as they're looking for a customer. So it's really a match made in heaven. And so again, I'll answer your question this way, Eunice kind of, you know, I'm going to spin it back to, you know, kind of my, I've been on trying to dominate rankings for 20 some years. So, uh, you know, again, that consistent content, like these guys are describing, like Mike, I love what Mike just said. Um, you know, how I, what I, what I talk about with clients, how can we bring your facility to the client into their lap? And again, no trade shows for the past three months, no on-site mm -hmm. visits, no face-to-face. -face. How can we treat our, our, our residents, our business, as if it's a, I call it like a five-star resort. Like we probably wouldn't go on a, a nice vacation without, you know, what's the, the facility look like? What are the workout facilities? What's the pool? But, you know, if you have kids, you know, we want to do the same thing. Bring your facility to the customer, help them make that buying decision, whether um, content and, and I'm just real quick, I'm going to share this great strategy that I picked up. Um, on your consistent strategy, you know, come up with a content strategy on a weekly basis, okay? So company I'm, I'm doing this fun project with, it's called Falcon Electronics. 
we came up with a wire harness manufacturer. We came up with Wire Harness Wednesdays. So every Wednesday, we started just coming out with content, like types of wires, and just anything that we could think of that our persona, again, like that engineer at Boeing would want to read about. So after like several months went by, also we had a whole arsenal. We had like an archive of content. I picked up this incredible tip. It was a gentleman on a podcast. He was a, he works at Shopify. He was on the Dennis Brown Growth Experts podcast. And he shared, what you do is you take your blogs, kind of like smush them together and create like a monster resource guide, you know, mm -hmm. like maybe five, 6,000 words after like your target keyword. And man, I'll tell you, like if you, tar if you Google any of our keywords, we have what's called the Google snippet which is that little real estate box that you now see on Google. And, uh, and again, when you, when you Google your keyword, your core competency, what you are best at, look at the competition. If you see a Google page that doesn't have video, doesn't have images, doesn't have a lot of content, man, that's just ripe for the picking for you to capture that first page ranking. And lastly, that's why I'm so bullish on the marketplaces, like what Mike's talking about, because with the marketplaces, they're going after the same keywords I'm going after. And as a manufacturer, if I can put my product on Amazon, on Alibaba, DigiKey is a great marketplace. Uh, we have product on Zorro. Um, Ryan was talking about Zorro earlier. I don't care because they're attacking the same keywords I am. And again, so to answer, your, to go back to your question, that's how I help reduce the, the need for my facility per se is because I'm bringing, I'm stop being the best kept secret. I'm bringing my facility to my customer in that aspect from the keyword standpoint and from the content that I can solve your problem and gosh darn it, I can do it the best as anybody and you, you know, we need to uh, hook up. So that's kind of the preach yeah. that we're running on. I love it. I, I think a lot of people get overwhelmed with Google and they, you know, they think, oh, that's for somebody else, not me. But taking control of Google, my page, my business page, for example, is so easy and for a manufacturer to put in their content at even at that point to grab it from the beginning is so critical, right? We are coming up to the end. We're going to have to close this off. We have we have covered a really wide, wide mm -hmm. gamut. And so, uh, again, look, we would happily connect you with uh, with experts. If you've got more questions, um, please submit them even after afterwards. And uh, and mm -hmm. who knows, it might be a, another panel session or uh, or we'll connect you to uh, to the person that you need a uh, you need to connect to. Um, I do want to do uh, a couple of polls, so I'm going to say thank you to our panelists and uh, and, and and sincere sincere thanks to uh, to Mike and to Kurt.